What's up? This is David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital, and you're listening to The Long Game. In this episode, we chat with Gaurav Vora. Gaurav was a founding member of Superhuman, the Silicon Valley email startup that gives users the fastest email experience ever made. He was their head of growth, where he grew annual recurring revenue from zero to over $10 million and led a team of 35 across growth and go-to-market. Since then, he's worn the hats of Superhuman's head of product, head of marketing, and is currently their head of analytics. Gaurav advises startups on growth, which includes product, marketing, analytics, and general company building. In this conversation, we talk about how Gaurav ended up at Superhuman after spending some time in management consulting. He also shares the thinking behind why they believed Superhuman was positioned to win amongst a sea of competitors. He talks through the thinking behind why they made it so difficult for people to access the product and even intentionally turned people away. Everything they did was counterintuitive to what most people would consider best practices for product-led growth. Gaurav also shares their strategy behind user acquisition and how to think about growth in the current macroeconomic environment with the need to grow while also being judicious with your budget. He talks about growing through word of mouth, but not just any word of mouth. He talks about love first word of mouth. Yes, love first word of mouth. This was a really fun and insightful conversation with some great stories that Gaurav doesn't usually share. Here's my conversation with Gaurav Vora. Gaurav, welcome to The Long Game. Appreciate it. I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I've been really looking forward to chatting with the mastermind behind the growth <laughs> of Superhuman. I know you'll probably say you're not the only one behind it, but you're the head of growth. You have the title. I'm just going <laughs> to give it to you. I appreciate so that. We'll get into that time at Superhuman. I think that that's a big thing we'll jump into, but I kind of want to start us at um, a point before you joined Superhuman. So you were in management consulting at <laughs> Oliver Wyman before right. joining tech. Yep. So how did that happen? How did you end up at Superhuman? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll actually go back uh, to a point in time prior to management consulting, uh, okay. even which is, um, you know, thinking about what I wanted to get into from a career point of view. I actually had my first gig as um, kind of a sales analyst slash internal PM, kind of like a you, you could imagine it's just like a growth associate uh, or, or like a RevOps kind of role at. A software company called Redgate Software, which is uh, was and is a tech startup based in Cambridge in England. Uh, they build ostensibly like superhuman for database developers, right? It's like all the power tools and productivity improvements. If you happen to be a database architect or engineer or developer, and this precedes the whole wave of data science and analytics in the last fifteen years. This is, you know, back when the job title was DBA. But what I did was, you know, I helped the kind of go-to-market teams, the renewals team, the sales team, kind of be more effective by figuring out who they need to be talking to, how they kind of upsell and close and make more revenue, but also really understanding the product that they're actually selling to these customers. It was a great gig. So I was kind of in tech before I even went into management consulting uh, and that, you know, through that opportunity. It was cool because it also was a role where really early on I learned some pretty like transferable technical skills like SQL. Uh, obviously, the whole company was to do with SQL and databases. But I wanted to get into more of a business of uh, you know frame of mind. I wanted to understand kind of the commercials and, and how a company actually runs better, and that's what drew me to consulting. So I did that for about did consulting for about five years. And consulting, as I'm sure you know, runs the gamut. Right? It's like everything from organizational transformation and really high level stuff through to nitty gritty execution of specific projects uh, and initiatives. And what I found myself being pulled onto both because I, I cared about it, but also because the company like put me on those projects was creating software that helped in, in, in that case, our clients uh, be more effective, right? So I would, I would be the person who as a consultant was actually like getting my hands pretty dirty building software. And initially, that was, yeah. So I was, I would say I was kind of in tech, not in building consulting. Slide decks. 
I did a couple slide decks and I hated it uh, so much so that I actually built a a productivity tool in all, like within Oliver Wyman that automated the creation of uh, slides. Um, wow. It allowed you know a consultant sitting in London to create a slide and then upload it to a central database, and, and a consultant sitting in Sydney could use that in their deck like the next minute, right? And so like you didn't spend any time creating slides. It was like that's how much I hated making slide decks. Was <laughs> I, I built? I made an entire tool that just automated that. But um, that was side of desk. That was a that was a fun little project. Um, but yeah, what I was building was not slide decks. It was software that the clients would be using to do everything from make pricing decisions to figure out like risk profile of their investments to, you know, negotiate better with their suppliers, like all kinds of stuff that like companies need. And it was like tons of data on one end and a slick and clean UI on the other end and having to, you know, basically do everything, uh, and do those pieces and everything in between while also figuring out business problems, understanding how businesses work. So I did that. And I was you know, fortunate enough to be invested in by people who were more senior in the company than me, who were more technical and more business savvy and you know, just further along. And when I say invested in, I mean that they kind of opened up opportunities for me to join that team and like have those in, like, I guess, make those investments in my skill set. I realized I wanted to get into tech. Why? Because a couple of things all my experiences that I'd enjoyed were in tech, uh, the ones I just talked through. And also, you know, uh, I have family and relatives who at that point in time had been in tech for quite some time, including my brother, who uh, was the founder and CEO of Reportive. And that, you know, was a great story, a uh, great product loved by many and was acquired by LinkedIn. And I sort of saw all that happening while I was in consulting. And I was like, you know, that's awesome, like that you can build a product like that and get so much love so quickly. And uh, is becomes this much bigger and bigger and better thing that makes the world a better place. And of course, Reportive was like the the app that kickstarted it all in terms of yeah productivity plugins for email in particular, whether it's Yesware or uh, Mixmax or like you know Boomerang, like lot Chrome extensions were were cool. Yeah, it was before. Yeah, it was before you could have a whole company be a Chrome extension in terms of like the product, right? And it made that ecosystem a thing. And indeed, it was the precursor to Superhuman, which, of course, uh, is is sort of like reported, but a thousand times more ambitious in, in terms of scope and surface area. So, But I saw all that happen. I saw it up close and personal and, and firsthand. And I was like, you know, tech is, tech is, tech is where it's at. It's where you're able to have the, you know, the, the most massive amount of impact uh, with the skills that I have and like the things I enjoy doing intrinsically. Um, and so that's what brought me out to... San Francisco from London. It's what um, kind of got me more into tech to begin to begin with. And so, how did the conversation to join Superhuman start? Was like, did your brother pull you in, or did you go and say, "Hey, I can help you"? <laughs> yeah, this is a this is a funny story. I uh, um, I don't talk about this a whole ton, but I'll share it with you. Um, shortly after getting to San Francisco, and I was still working with a consulting firm at that time. But shortly after arriving here, I started to explore what does it look like for me to join a tech company and one of my first realizations was i need a company that is going to put up with my visa uh, shenanigans right it's a, com- a company that will i guess be okay with the long timeline that that is just a fact of life to get a work visa and a permit to actually work at the company so that pretty much ruled out most all big companies because they just can't be bothered with that and sort of, you know, I was going to narrow down to like smaller companies where I knew people personally, and it was more of a like, there was more of a connection. And uh, this is a true story. <laughs> I put together a, a, a sort of application, a, a speculative ap- application uh, for a company, and I actually ran it past my brother. I said, "Hey, you know, what do you think? This is an application I put together. It wasn't for like working with him or anything." And he looked at it, and he was like wow, this is really good. This is a great application. Um, He gave me some pointers and he was like, but this is so great. I want to hire you. Ha. (laughs) And like, that was it. It was an email. Uh, I want to hire you, period. Ha, exclamation point. Uh, And I was like... You had no no underlying plans of him like deciding to hire you when you sent that over? I did not, no. Um, And I'll tell you why, because... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so this was at the start of 2015. The reason I had no underlying plans for that is because I didn't know that he was doing anything because he worked at LinkedIn as oh. uh, part of the acquisition up until 20, 
early 2014, left LinkedIn. And as far as I knew, he was in kind of this like exploratory sort of no man's land of, um, you know, coming up with ideas, but also just like catching up on like five years of life and like doing all, yeah. all, all the stuff he missed through reported. And I didn't know he was doing anything. So I truly had no ulterior motive or like, yeah. you know, ex- extra sort of uh, goal. But I saw that email and I saw that message. and I was like, okay, well, if you're serious, let's have a conversation, right? Like, tell me what you're thinking about and like, what are you working on? So he sat me down, uh, we, we, we met up and he kind of shared his vision for superhuman. This was kind of late January, 2015. And, uh, it was a, it was a very basic slide deck that had, you know, balsamic wireframes and mockups. And it was all the sort of early concepts of what he thought superhuman could be this idea of taking the magic of reportive and also all these other ideas that would make email so much better than uh, it's ever been before. And that was all laid out. It was all laid out in this vision deck prior to a single line of code having ever been written and prior to anyone else being on board. And I think he may have only just gotten like a first check from, from our very first sort of angel slash seed investors. Um, indeed, that was the deck being used, I think, to talk to those investors as well. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, this is this is exactly the kind of thing I'm excited by, right? Like as a consultant, I spend my days in email, you know, when I'm not building software or writing code, it's just a lot of email back and forth. And productivity is so critical. You know, they joke in consulting that when they teach you how to use a spreadsheet, they like, you know, rip out the mouse and they they sort of force you to use the keyboard, right? And frankly, I was I was one of those people who who just took to that. Like I loved that. I'm a gamer. I use keyboard shortcuts. I, I care about my productivity and my efficiency. And I would be the person who would like, you know, teach the newbies and consulting like how to be effective and use the best shortcuts and the best kind of productivity hacks. And I saw all of that applied to this area that takes everyone so much time, which is email. And I was like, wow, the opportunity to build, you know, this product that impacts so many people and is such a pain point for everyone. Uh, that sounds amazing, right? Like I would love to be a part of that. And so, you know, from I'm that- getting chills. I'm getting chills hearing uh, <laughs> like your, all your unique experiences, like crammed into Gaurav Vora, like just made you the perfect person to go <laughs> superhuman. In that I respect. really, I really appreciate that. Yeah. That's, and that's what it felt like. It just felt so serendipitous and like the right thing, the right fit. Um, yeah. I'm like, what I, what, what had I been doing? I'd been growing companies, right? I'd been helping companies be effective. So I understood from a customer's mindset, like, what do you care about? But also from a business mindset, how do you actually make more money? How do you grow? How do you put in place processes and scale teams and all that kind of fun stuff? So yeah, yeah, what I was brought in to do, and this is what I did for the first five years of Superhuman was really be the growth person. So that started out as a very much hands-on kind of IC role. I was, you know, running around San Francisco, onboarding our first few hundred customers and doing everything, right? Everything necessary in order to grow. And there was even a period where all I did was hire engineers because in order to grow, we needed more like R&D bandwidth to build the product. So I was like, well, I will spend every minute that I'm awake thinking about how to hire engineers faster because that's what we need in order to grow. Yeah. So um, then, and then, if it's okay, I want to pause you there. Yeah, go for it. You kind of brushed over this conversation with <laughs> your brother with his pitch deck. And I just have to ask, because I know that many email clients have come and gone. Yeah. To, I've tried out many, maybe a dozen or so, and just, they never felt right. Right. And did you look at Rahul and say like, dude, are you sure? I mean, the email <laughs> space is so complex and there's competitors and lots of surface area, mm-hmm. high expectations with very demanding like users. What, yeah. what gave you guys the conviction that this was the thing that you want to go after? That's a great question. I did have that thought. We talked about that a lot. That was a common theme, especially in the first three years of the company, but especially in that first year, in, in, in fact. Um, and, and the reason why is that was a time in tech history, I suppose, when there was a massive proliferation in mail apps. Uh, we had, in that window... Uh, Mailbox, which was really popular, acquired by Dropbox, later shut down. Uh, I, Accompli, I was very disappointed. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot, millions of people did. It was, it was the first big one, but there were others. There was, uh, Accompli and Astro and, um, you know, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting like the full, the full set, right. But there were just so many that 
were around at that time or being started at that time. And a couple of things kind of gave conviction. So one, seeing Mailbox, we were like, okay, look, there is clearly a market. There is also a product that can potentially, you know, reach product market fit or like approach product market fit. Um, it, we've seen that. And, and like, this is an area that is ripe for more innovation. Two is kind of a counterintuitive uh, feeling in, in business, or maybe counterintuitive to some, which is it's good when there's tons of competition. What that means is that there's a big enough market that it's a place where you want to play. There's nothing worse than being in a market that just doesn't exist and won't exist no matter how hard you try. Of course, if you can create a new market out of nothing, then, you know, Godspeed and, and uh, you know, congratulations. But if there is competition in your space, that is fundamentally a good thing. And look at that. Look at that with the glass, you know, glass half full kind of mindset. So we saw, I saw the competition. I'm like, great. Okay. But then it's like, how do you win? How do you kind of have the conviction that you will have a different outcome to all those other competitors? And at the time, you know, it was hard to know this because those competitors were operating and so were we, right? I look back with hindsight and, and I know many of them have been acquired and or, and or shut down um, for various reasons. But at the time, it was a question of what are our edges? Why, why do we think Superhuman could win? Or like, why do we think we might be able to um, succeed? A couple of things. One, prior experience, like having done a startup before, not being a freshman founder, but having prior experience in this exact area, not just as reported, but also at a much larger tech company of LinkedIn. Uh, and indeed, you know, other founding members of Superhuman bringing to bear incredible experience in, a, in, in this whole area. Uh, two, having investor backing and having the runway to make good long-term decisions and not being in a position where we were making short-term decisions to gain you know, users, but ultimately churning them all out because the product isn't good enough. And we can talk more about sort of how we approach that in the first few years. And that's something we did very differently to a lot of the other companies. And I think three was vision. It was, it was the idea that there's this massive market Right. And it's like as big as, you know, cars, like everyone, everyone drives a car, like so many people drive a car, but, and we were going in with very much of an Apple or even like a Tesla sort of, uh, approach, but we said, look, we want to start at the top of this market. We will get to the entire market. That is absolutely the plan, but we do want to start at the top. And the reason is we want to build the absolute best product and experience. You know, we're playing this game on very hard mode. We want to go for the highest expectation customer in this huge, huge market and challenge ourselves to build the best thing imaginable. And that is vision, right? That is a vision of let's build the best, let's make it increasingly more available and accessible over time, but challenge ourselves to build the best product that solves the problem the most deeply. And that was a very compelling vision, right? That, that set immediately in my head set things apart from uh, other companies that were sort of trying to do the same thing. Those were some of the thoughts that uh, yeah. we discussed and kind yeah, of went, went through our heads. We're, we're going to dig into the weeds uh, in a little bit with like the onboarding that you're, you're all so well known for. Before mm -hmm. that, you did start mentioning you, you've straddled many roles, like head of growth, head yeah. of product, head of marketing. Now you're head of analytics and biz ops. So, and like strategy, yeah. <laughs> strategy and biz ops. So uh, tell, or not biz ops. I think I heard that on another interview. <laughs> <laughs> that, tell me about how you're able to straddle so many different functions. Like, sure, yeah. there are some like overlapping skill sets, but how did you figure out, say, how to hire great engineers, how to hire great marketers, how to hire great analysts? Th those are kind of different profiles. Yeah, I think the first thing I'm going to say is, um, you know, a, a, a big dose and pinch of humility, right? Like, there are there are certain roles in that set that I'm really good at, and there are many that I am only passing at, right? Like, I'm sort of like a, a good person to do it for a chunk of time. And then you want to bring in someone who's been doing it for like a decade or two, right? To, to really take it to the next level. But And I think for anyone who's a early startup uh, founding team member or employee or founder, it's it's important to have that, you know, mindset. It's like, yes, I can take this on. I'll I'll do it, right? I'm a team player. I'll, I'll learn and I'll kind of roll my sleeves up. But it's also important to recognize one's own strengths and one's own, um, I guess, relative areas where you just don't have that experience or you don't have those skills. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Um, the second thing I want to say is that I am, or I guess I consider myself a, a lifelong learner. I want to be constantly learning about areas that I'm less good at and, and to kind of grow in those areas. 
which you know pulls me in different directions. I'm I'm very much the generalist who 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 wants to understand like the whole puzzle. Um, but I also appreciate that just being a strict generalist uh, means that at some point, or indeed like very quickly, you stop adding value because you can only go so far in a particular area. So I'm I'm very drawn to the idea of T-shaped uh, individual or a T-shaped kind of skill set, which is a common concept in um, you know in, in professional development. And for me, I would say like the vertical of my T is really in that data and analytics, right? That is the place where I you know, years and years and years of experience and applied to so many different places. The cool thing about that as the T, and when you add things on the bar, whether it's marketing or products or hiring or whatever, is it's a it's a T that is actually very much in support of other areas, right? Like data is so useful when you're hiring. It's so useful when you're uh, doing marketing. It's so useful for products, um, growth, customer teams. Like it, 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 is, it is the thing that like every function ultimately needs even at a very early stage or even when it's like very mature. So I generally bring a very data-centric approach to all those areas. Um, and then I think like the last thing I would say is that like I just had the, I had the goal of wanting to grow the company and recognizing that in order to grow the company, you really do just have to roll your sleeves up and do the hard thing sometimes, right? If the blocker to growth is something that's like really not, my skill set, like not something I want to do, but it is what it is something that needs to be done. And for example, interview like 500 engineers or like go and onboard hundreds and hundreds of customers in person. Like if that's what you have to do, I will do it uh, and learn how to do it really, really well. Uh, and that's just kind of like, I um, guess that's, we, we call that these days at Superhuman kind of the ownership mentality or the kind of grit mentality of saying, look, though this is not necessarily my specialty i will i will do it because it is what's necessary yeah i love that and uh, i think you you were alluding to that just now like onboarding hundreds of customers in person uh you mentioned and um, i think that's related to a lot of the counterintuitive things that super mm -hmm. did for a product-led growth company right like you had i think some people have called it a survey i call it an application uh <laughs> to become a user there's a wait list, there's high touch onboarding, like you had to jump on a call, you had yeah. to put a credit card up front. Um, and mm -hmm. then at the end of all that, you realize it's $30 a month. So again, you were going for the premium high end of the market. Yeah. Which, all that is, I'd say the opposite of what most people say to do, which is less friction is better, which right. I actually disagree with. But tell us about the thinking behind all of that and why you were <laughs> running around onboarding hundreds <laughs> of customers yeah, what was it, what was I doing? Like doing playing the game on very hard mode. We could have just let people use the product. I know, yeah, wild. <laughs> we we had a couple of fundamental realizations uh, really, really early on. So I think like the biggest realization was that this is a space where the product is critical. If you make the product and there are bugs or it's feature incomplete or, you know, maybe it works, but it's just kind of slow and doesn't feel nice. It's not going to retain fundamentally. It's not going to create delight more importantly, as retention is, you know, a very kind of growth way of thinking about things. But like our, our, our true North Star is, are we creating delight for our users? And that's an emotional thing. And for us to set that as the bar that we need to clear, that means that we can't just let people have access and, you know, give it a shot and then kind of be our, you know, our, our sort of training bodies in, 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 the, in the crash test, like over and over again. Like that's not, that's not a delightful thing to put customers through. Uh, I guess we're fortunate in that we all use the product internally so we could dog food it obsessively. So we were able to really be our own strongest critics early on. And that was like our biggest kind of product growth loop and, and, and kind of iteration loop and still is actually, but we realize that the product really matters. And so we we can't just let people access it and, and then churn out because they encountered critical issues or, or, is, or frustrating moments. And those moments could range from everything from, I wrote an email and sent it and it did not send, or I was in the middle of writing an email and my draft just disappeared. And I have no idea what happened to half an hour of work. Like these are, these are really bad things to happen to a customer. 
all the way through to, gosh, I really wish you all had like a remind me feature. Like I have that over in Mixmax, but I don't have it in C, you know. Okay, so we need to build that. All the way through to, um, I need this on my iPhone and you don't yet have it on your, you know, on there's no app yet. So, okay, lo lots of things that we need to build and get right. Um, that was the f first thing. Second thing is like, who are we onboarding? Like, who is this product built for, right? And then you probably read and uh, know about our, our approach to the highest expectation customer, like going after the person for whom email is life, right? And life is email, or indeed it's their work life and their work life is email. So we, we have this stat, which is like the average professional spends three hours a day on email. And that is true. But we are going after, like initially, we were going after the highest expectation customer who spends 10 hours a day on email, right? Like they live and breathe email. So this is all your VCs. They have to be awesome at email. This is founders, CEOs, they're constantly fundraising or recruiting or doing early sales customer conversations over email. Um, all the people for whom email is critical for, the, for them to be professionally successful. And uh, because they have a very high bar and also their, their, their time is inc incredibly um, precious and important, we want to be really respectful and mindful of the investment that they'll put into trying out a new product. And so if we're going to go after that customer, we, we, we should give them the best experience, which means showing up at their offices and giving them the best experience and onboarding them to this thing, which admittedly, like, it's a big ask early on, right? Like there's going to be a lot of resistance and hesitation and skepticism. And we're there to kind of get them through all of that and still leave them with a delightful experience. Um, I talked about this on a, and then, you know, talking about like, why did we onboard? I talked about this in a recent podcast uh, interview, kind of some of the reasons that you may want to onboard as a company or as a product. There's a lot that we do in the onboarding that is really hard to put into software or to trans you know, transcribe into uh, a self-guided walkthrough. There's like habit migration, um, to, you know, for email in particular. All the shortcuts, yeah. Yeah, using keyboard shortcuts instead of a mouse. That's something you can physically help someone with, right? Like you can literally reach over and, and sort of <laughs> gently pat them on the back of their hand if they use the mouse <laughs> or telling them, hey, look, you just marked that email unread. You shouldn't do that. You should just archive it instead. Or, um, you know, really encouraging them to, to adopt a new workflow that's different to the one they've been doing for a decade. Uh, not all companies have this. Like some companies or products don't require a habit change or the habit change is really simple. But if the habit change is really hard, that's like a good reason to onboard. Uh, second is if we want to pick up on bugs and feature requests. Again, like there are tools to help you do that. But in our case, we really want to see those bugs and hear those feature requests. We want to see those firsthand. We don't want to wait for someone to tell us. We want to just see it. And I would frequently in my onboardings be uh, watching the person use the product and think they wouldn't even notice the bug, but I'd be like, oh God, that didn't, that didn't work. That didn't work. And I'm writing all that down after the onboarding, sending it over to the you know engineering team, getting it logged, et cetera. And then thirdly, human connection and brand creation, right? Like we want to we want to leave everyone with a positive impression of of who we are as people. And even if they churn, we want them to still look back fondly on the time that they spent with me or people at Superhuman. And that could be because it was just a nice experience. You know, we, we show up positive, friendly. We help them with stuff outside of superhuman and email. We help them with productivity and just like well-being in general and just constantly provide value and add, you know, these moments of delight. And that was something I was very like deliberate and intentional. But those are some of the things that were really important for us, which is why we were so obsessed about talking to our customers and kind of hand-holding them through the experience up front. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if this is something that you all did, but what I'm imagining when I was at HubSpot and I was running experiments on onboarding, we would put out one version of onboarding and then review the data and like look at the screen recordings. And then we would be working on a next version. But while we're working on a next version, people are still going through that mm -hmm. onboarding flow. And then we'd release the next one. But after like, you know, hundreds or thousands of people have already gone through the non-optimized one. And we just keep doing that. But for you, you kind of had this mechanism where you can, you had a wait list. You can say, all right, we're letting in 1,000 people for this next cohort. No one else. Mm -hmm. See how they do on onboarding with the new features and bug fixes. And then decide if you want to let more people into the next. Like, so you control your cohorts versus yeah. like for a product that just let the floodgates open. Like you, yeah. you couldn't control that. And actually, I would, I would 100%, yeah, 100% uh, agree with you. I would add, way smaller numbers, not even a thousand. Like, how about two, right? <laughs> how about we take two people in this week? 
uh, and they're going to be like friends of ours who are VCs. So it's like they're friendly and they'll keep using the product even if something bad happens, but they are highest expectation customers, right? They're in the right persona or whatever. Uh, and do we retain those two? Okay. If we're, if we're retaining two, like how about five? What about 10, right? And like, these are manual things. Are these real s- numbers that you were, you were like letting people oh, yeah. in at that pace? Wow. Oh yeah. Like that was the early, early company, you know, we would celebrate our wins on a Friday and it'd be like, Friday rolls around, everyone gets, a, you know, a drink of choice. Uh, and we're like, what do we do this week? It's like, well, I onboarded two whole people, <laughs> two real human beings. Look, here are their faces and their names. Here's what they do for a living. And look at their stats. They're actually using the product every day. You know, I mean, I'm serious. This is this is what we were doing early on, and I love that. <laughs> I think if you're an, if you're a founder in a market where the product has any of the same characteristics I mentioned, you know, it is worth thinking about it in those terms. You will get to the point where it's thousands uh, in a week, and you know, you sort of start to open those floodgates. That is all in the future for a, a company that is growing and successful. But I would never advocate to start with that unless there's a really yeah. really important reason to do so. So that I. I, of course, did some research before our conversation, and I recall an interview you did where you were talking about, I don't think you used this exact word, but a, like a non-launch for Superhuman, where mm, yeah. you don't believe companies should do a launch like some would and try to just get as many people as possible into this new product. Um, tell us about <laughs> that that whole thinking, because letting in two people a week, like, yeah, I would think a lot of people are like, wait, what? Why would they like slow it down so much? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, and when you've got you've got a single onboarding generates like 15 bugs, <laughs> and then that same user sends you like 20 feedback emails over the next 24 hours, like that's a lot of work. That's like your entire engineering team's work for a whole week, right? And like you know, you know that if they encounter those bugs and send that feedback, every single person else is going to encounter the same bugs and feedback or more. And you you know that it's just not worth having all those other customers kind of hit those same issues. So so that's kind of why the the, the why too. But I have a really uh, I guess this is inculcated from my superhuman time. I have a really particular perspective on launches, which is that if you're launching, you should go massive. You should launch as uh, impressively and as loudly as you possibly can as a company. It is so hard to cut through the noise as a company, as a startup, and you really want your launch to be big and impressive and uh, joyous and momentous for your employees and your investors and your customers. Uh, and so it's really important to do that really well. So I'm not a non-believer in launches, but I am pretty keen on this idea that your launch motion and actually letting people use the product can be two distinct things, right? So we, in the early days, did several launches. We had we had several big moments that, um, in our case, kind of grew the wait list or gathered email addresses, like people who we knew expressed interest in in sort of using the product. Uh, And those were things like when we first launched our website and we had a really big uh, announcement on social media and uh, I think there was a little bit of press and and we did, I think, maybe a product hunt thing. And then about 10 months after that, we did a huge product hunt launch, right? Like we we co-launched Superhuman with product hunt upcoming it was like a new area of product hunt for products that were not yet uh fully available but would be available soon and we actually were the most signed up for product on product hunt last i checked ever through that launch in terms of the number of email addresses that it collected the number of like people who expressed interest uh you know this is all thanks to our massive market i suppose (laughs) Um, we, we put a lot of effort into those launches and of course it generates all the other stuff that a launch generates, like a ton of social media interest and investor inbound and, you know, people banging down your door trying to gain access and, and all that good stuff. And then of course, like subsequent launches, like when the, um, you know, the mobile app was first ready or, um, even just last year when we launched Outlook support, like, you know, making launches big is a really big deal. And, and that, you know, I, I believe in a multi-channel, multi, uh, multi-pronged approach from a marketing point of view, everything from PR and social to ads and community and and, and your owned and earned channels where you can get the, the message out there. But that doesn't have to be the same as letting people use the product. <laughs> so in our case, it was a question of like, okay, we've got 50,000 email addresses. We've got 100,000 email. We've got a load of people who really want access. Now let's be judicious and start to kind of let people gain access. You know, let's let's pretend that we are 
producing this thing on an assembly line and like we just have some supply constraints in terms of like bugs fixed or things we need to build and um kind of view it that way and you you know you've got to manage your community and like keep those signups um informed and and engaged and excited about what you're doing but um, more importantly you have actual paying customers who uh, you need to retain and delight and so that's where like 80 percent of the focus should go in and so you you mentioned a couple of those launches that you you did earlier on and it's maybe i just haven't been paying enough attention to like tech news recently because i'm not really <laughs> on twitter or anything as much anymore but it doesn't seem like there's as much hype now and superhuman like y'all have been building still releasing mm-hmm. new features how are you thinking about customer acquisition now i imagine you still yeah. have a long wait list and you want to keep adding to that i think i noticed that you don't have a survey on a website anymore, yeah so, so it seems like you're reducing some friction yeah great question so everything we've talked to up until this point i would say is like first year or two for a company that has you know has those characteristics hard product, uh, complicated surface area, high expectation customer, et cetera. After a certain point in time, all of that stuff starts to just become operationally inhibiting growth. And I am of the mindset that you need to pick a point where you start to flip over into self-serve mode and you start to deploy your more friction, uh, I guess, friction moments, your human capital, your... um, high touch handholding, you start to deploy those strategically against your high value areas or pockets. So there are many companies that that have grown in in, in the manner I'm describing, but I think Atlassian is one of the best in the business having done so, where they aggressively engineered all the friction out of their signup funnels and really made it such that you didn't have to speak to anyone to get going on this software that could very quickly become enterprise software at your company. Of course, they have a sales team that talks to you when you need to talk to them, and they have a, you know, customer success and all those kinds of functions. But I do believe that um, it's really important to to take that friction away after you don't like once you don't need it. And so we've taken most of the friction away. We've taken nearly all of it, in fact, away. There's still some things that we do differently that is maybe you know other companies wouldn't do. Like we still ask for a credit card up front, and um, we still strongly recommend uh talking to someone for the onboarding although it's not required like it used to be but i think it's it's very important to sort of reduce that friction because at a certain point in time like you will be beyond your early adopters you will be beyond those i guess those that initial persona and and you'll be growing into new markets and new personas you'll be crossing the chasm into a larger maybe more general uh group of of customers and that's okay you know you as a company you grow and like your focus changes and your strategy and your tactics can kind of evolve um so we've definitely made those changes i'd also say that i think the tech industry has had its own changes in terms of what uh i guess channels or what creates kind of excitement and hype you know mid 2010s email apps would blow up on twitter everyone loved email apps and so you know you'd hear about a new email app and it'd be the thing that was trending and people were signing up for it. And, uh, you know, we were riding that wave at the time as well, of course. Now on Twitter, it's all about AI, right? It's all about the next new tool that's going to automate a whole category of uh, white collar work or, uh, you know, the, the, the massive, the mind boggling advancements in technology that are coming out using compute power. And that's, that's the thing that people are really excited about. Back then, a TechCrunch article could be make or break for a company. Now, all PR is paywalled and, you know, news outlets, I'm sorry, are, are paywalled. And it's really hard to generate as much interest and traffic from a single, you know, TechCrunch or Verge article like it used to be. And so things have changed, right? Like it's really hard to generate the same kind of hype around the exact same tactics. So I think what's what's more important than, I guess, like trying to copy and, and exactly replicate old strategies is to, is to distill like what actually works about those strategies. Um, and see how that applies to the world we live in today. And a lot of companies doing this really well. They they are companies that are similarly shaped to superhuman in terms of the product, but they are doing things like adding AI into their products and using that as the hook for their you know big flashy social media and uh, news article launch, which makes sense. You know, if that is truly a way to add value for your customer and if that's part of the product, then that's awesome. And it does it does generate kind of that intrigue and excitement. 
Yeah. One thing that I find fascinating about how superhuman grew was at least from the, from the outside point of view, it didn't seem like you all just threw money at it and yeah. just ran a bunch of paid ads. Like you were very judicious in how you're acquiring users, who you're mm-hmm. letting in. How do you think about that in this current environment? You know, there like mm-hmm. lots of companies are looking at being more judicious about paid marketing spend. Lots of companies have cut spend. Yeah. There are some who are doing really well, but I'd even I'd argue that they're also not just throwing money at their problems. So mm-hmm. how would you think about like growing or user acquisition in, in this sort of environment, trying to be uh, like doing more with less essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really great question. I mean, the macroeconomic conditions do mean that companies want to preserve their runway. They want to preserve their, uh, hard earned, uh, dollars and they don't want to throw that money, you know, into the marketing well <laughs> to see, you know, to see what happens and, and, and to be dependent on paying for growth. Right. And I think, I think there are some companies for whom, uh, that is the way they grow and that works. Like they, they spend a dollar and get $5. So like, why wouldn't you just put a million dollars in and get, five? you know, that that's totally fine. I think I will also mention the caveat of like, well, if everyone's pulling back that paid spend, of course, it's going to be way cheaper to purchase ads now than even six months ago. And so there's probably some low hanging fruit and some gains for some smart marketers out there who recognize that. And they're like, wow, well, my like bids are just like way cheaper these days. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm killing it. <laughs> Uh, so there's definitely some, there's al- there's always these little arbitrage and like kind of fluctuations to sort of take advantage of. But if we zoom right back out and think about overall kind of like growth strategies, marketing channels, um, in this kind of an environment where you are, let's say, a founder with, let's say, 24 months of runway and you really want to hold on to that runway for the next 24 months, you don't want to spend on ads. I would argue that what you should be focused on is generating the highest quality level of uh, growth, which in my opinion, is word of mouth and referral based growth that can be achieved in a number of ways but the very very core of it and this is what we focus on really obsessively at superhuman is an amazing experience it's an experience that is so darn good that every single person who encounters the experience tells someone or many people about the experience they could have loved the product they could have loved the customer support they could have loved you, the random person who showed up at their office on board them. Um, they could have loved the design of your website or really anything about the end-to-end experience, but it was something that got their attention and they're like, oh, wow, I'm going to tell people about this. That is pure, you know, love, love first word of mouth. There are other ways to generate virality and there's, there's other ways. A, a new buzzword, love first word of mouth. <laughs> I love it. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna set a reminder and check in 24 months. Have I have I made that a thing? I, <laughs> I hope so. But um, you know, and there's other ways to generate virality and, and engineer it into the product. And of course, there's you know, product-led growth and expansion growth and products that have a team use case. So you go from one to three to ten. Like, of course, there's these other ways to grow. Um, and those are all great as well. The more of those you can layer on top, the better. But at the very core, cool, like the kernel, if you will, should be an awesome experience. Every company has the has the opportunity to create an awesome experience. So why not make that happen? And then layer on all the other stuff as well. <laughs> yeah. The the through line that I'm seeing in our conversation is, you know, in particularly product-led growth companies, there's all this talk about self-service, remove friction, and automate, productize as much as you can. Our whole conversation has essentially been insert more humans like love first word of mouth, build the relationship and like be choosy about who you allow into your product. Yeah. And, and I, go ahead. I was going to say, I would, I would actually say like the through line here, and it's one of our company core values at Superhuman, the through line of everything that we've been talking about is this idea of creating delight. It's like, why would you be introducing friction? Why would you have a human in the mix? Why would you be choosy about who to onboard? It's because we want to create delight. It's because we want to give you the best experience imaginable. And if that's not there as kind of the North Star or the, the the anchor point for all of these other things, then very quickly those other things can start to get pretty weird pretty fast, right? Like you'll be you'll be you'll be uh, restricting who you gain access to and be like, why am I doing this? Like this is just starting to not feel great. Uh, yeah. Could we just be giving more people access? And would it be delightful? Oh yeah, it would be. Okay, let's just let's get let's do that. <laughs> you know? I look at some of the companies, the best in the world that that achieve this, like Apple and um, 
you know, they, they, they obsessively try and create delight and, and create these moments of magic for their customers. Um, they have the line outside the Apple store when they release a new mm -hmm. uh, product. But it's not like they want the line to last for that long. Right? Like they want to clear the line within a few days. And they sure as heck have people working pretty much around the clock inside the store, like working through that demand and like losing customers where they're at. So, you know, you, you, you have to have a North Star. You have to have like this idea that ties it all together. In our case, it's create delight. I would vouch that every company should be thinking about how they create delight for their customers. Yeah, I love it. And one thing that I, I'm also recognizing in our conversation is there's this, I mean, people talk about being customer obsessed. You, I think you really embody that in like kind of the stories you shared. And it takes a lot of empathy and listening and self-awareness to see through your own bias, to mm -hmm. accept all that feedback, to understand the nuances of customer feedback and relay that to your team. Yeah. I, I'm not sure the best way to, to phrase this, but like, how did you develop that approach to your work? Like, were there influences on you, like from growing yeah. up or like <laughs> mentors? I don't know. Yeah, that's a really interesting and great question. I think that you, you're absolutely right that being customer obsessed is you know, is the key. And, and, and indeed, like we were influenced and positively, yeah, positively influenced by companies doing this well before we were, right? Like whether it's Zappos, you know, being famous for uh, some of their quirky approaches to customer obsession, like who's the customer support rep who can stay on the phone the longest with a customer who calls in for a problem? It's because you're helping them so much. Or like, um, you know, Amazon was really, really good at, at customer service in the, early, you know, still is, but like in the early days in particular, I remember growing up and I was like 13 or something and had a problem with my Amazon delivery. And on their website, I could, I could get a phone call. They would call me, right? And I was in England. Like that never happened. Uh, this is, here, here's this American company that is uh, somehow set up to, to, to treat me with in such high esteem that they'll actually call me, call me to talk through this issue I, I face. I was very much you know, impressed and influenced by that. And there are lots of companies that are very customer obsessed that we drew influence from. But you're right, like in order to actually do it and be at the front lines of doing it, you need to have this immense amount of empathy and listening skills towards your customers. Uh, and it's very much something that I think through repetition and through um, just doing it over and over and over, you can, you can really develop, anyone can develop this muscle. I think everyone in a startup ideally does do that, develop this muscle, regardless of the function or team that you're in, listening to your customer for what they're actually saying and being able to empathize with them and meet them where they're at is so critical, whether you're a marketer or a salesperson or a growth person or a product person, it's really, really important to have that skill. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we would do. We would hear what they said in person. We would read what they would tell us over email and asynchronous communications and really obsess over those details, pour over their words. In fact, we actually have a database where we copy and paste feedback from customers. We still use it to this day. And it is the verbatim quote that every customer has ever told us that is a feature request uh, indicating what they want. And we would go through like word for word and try and understand what are they actually saying? What are they saying? And then at the, at the root of it, like, what do they want? Where are the patterns between what they're saying and what, you know, hundreds of other people are saying? Um, and that just requires like, I guess, an, a, a focus and a, a level of attention to detail, uh, as well as caring, you know, just caring about the customer and caring about their experience. Yeah, it's it's love. I mean, you you're like, I really want to understand what you're saying and I don't want to misunderstand. I, yeah. I can appreciate that a lot. Yeah. So uh, I want to throw this question in there and we, we can cut it out if you aren't comfortable. But <laughs> what's it like being co-founders with I mean, you're part of the founding team with yeah. with your brother. Like that's I think that's a unique experience. I don't think many people get like building a company with a sibling. Mm -hmm. um, what, what can you say about that whole experience and, and your relationship together? Yeah, I, I have nothing but positive things to say about that. It's been incredibly fun. It's been a privilege to have the opportunity to, to work together. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we both did different things before we kind of came together and started working on Superhuman. So it's been really awesome to learn from his experiences. And I, I hope that, you know, the same is felt in reverse, <laughs> you know, the things that I'd learned and brought, I've brought to the table. One of the things I'll say is that 
we have very complementary but also distinct skills and value add. So we we very much can be yin and yang in a good way uh, when it comes to advancing a topic. For example, Rahul is incredible at coming up with and then sharing uh, a vision, whether it's to investors or employees or customers. He's so good at that, like forward thinking kind of dare, you know, daring approach to product and business. Uh, I am incredibly uh, methodical and I will come up with the approach or the system or the, you know, cr- the archive or the library or the data for just about anything that you can imagine. Uh, these are these are things that respectively we do that, you know, the other person doesn't really enjoy doing or want to do. <laughs> so that's just an example of where it's really helpful if you do have those different spikes. But I think where we where we are the same is we're both incredibly maybe left-brained in terms of like having a Socratic or like rational approach to problem solving. Um, and that's where we can kind of like meet, meet in the middle. Um, I think the other thing that I would mention, and this is way more like just emotional, is like, you know, you know where the other person's coming from 90% of the time. Like you have an intuitive sense that is like deep in your bones as to as to where their head's really at and why. Um, you can you can kind of anticipate the other person's uh, feelings or moves or intent um, in a way that's that's really good. I would say this though. I'd say that you know some of some of that deep level of connection that I'm describing, like you can develop that with with a not someone who's not a sibling, someone who you may have worked with for you know five or ten years. Like you can get to that same level. I've, I've felt that same kind of connection with with folks I've worked with for that long. Um, and it's really it's a function of just how much time you've spent together, right? how much how much uh, interaction you've had. So to anyone listening who's uh, like, well, I don't think I'll ever have a chance to work with a sibling or a family member. It's like, well, that's okay. Um, you can get some of these really cool benefits from working with people who you've been connected to for a really long time, professionally or otherwise. I love that. It's it's kind of a case for staying at a company for a couple of years versus yeah. you know someone who stays there for six months or a year can't yeah. really build a relationship in that time. Hundred percent. Some of the people who I work with, and I still work with at Superhuman, uh, who, who I feel in the same way about, are those folks who are, you know, it's, we're coming up on four, five, six years of working together. Or, um, and there are people I've worked with at Oliver Wyman who I have worked with again since um, at Superhuman, and 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 it's yeah, it's that same thing. It's kind of that really long, long lasting connection, um, and it is very yeah, it is very much uh, an argument for working with the same people over an extended period of time, like this idea of getting teams back together across companies is yeah. one that I'm very, you know, very excited about. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in that. I, I'm as someone who's done a lot of hiring and team building. I'm, I'm not a big fan of people who hop around a lot, like, yeah. as you could imagine. <laughs> yeah, I feel the same. So uh, I, I'm going to take this in a little bit of a different direction because I yeah. learned that you became a father relatively recently, like a year and Mm -hmm. a half ago. But um, what I'd love to hear about is I saw your article, I believe in Fast Company about taking pat leave. Mm -hmm. And I mean, my impression of everyone at Superhuman is y'all are just hard driving, ambitious folks, probably working a lot. Um, What was it like stepping back after kind of being at the wheel for so many years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, It was awesome uh, having having the time and space to really focus uh, on family and be incredibly present as a new father, not just for, um, you know, for, for, for my, for my new child, but also for my partner and uh, the family unit as a whole and being able to be present for that was, was incredible. Um, I'm really, really grateful to kind of the, the, the two superhuman team and uh, everyone for kind of covering and uh, allowing that to be the case. Um, we have some really great policies around that. I also have um, I have a lot of, uh, I guess I've been influenced a lot by people who I've worked with earlier in my career, particularly Oliver Wyman, um, who were very outspoken in this go-getter environment of consulting, right? Where everyone is type A and trying to work incredibly hard to get to the next level of their career progression and, and all that stuff. And there were a couple of individuals who who, who spoke counter to that grain. And they said, look, family is important. Uh, personal happiness is important. Like work-life balance and, and, you know, not burning out is important. You know, it's 
as basic as that sounds right but like it was it was something that needed to be said in, in that sort of uh, environment and i think in 2023 now it's like much more in the collective consciousness of of you know professional workforce but you know 10 years ago or so it was it was a it was a daring thing to come out and say something like that but i was very much influenced by that and i was i, I was taken by the idea of uh working towards towards a an outcome where whatever you define as as your goal whether it's like being an awesome family member or being an incredible founding team member who does ship twice as fast as like every other person or every other company whatever your goal being able to work towards that goal and so i'm you know i'm i'm not here to say everyone should work 35 hour weeks or you know <laughs> like just, you know everyone's goals need to be the same like Eight years ago, my goal was to work as hard as I possibly could in the startup environment I was in. Uh, and now one of my goals is to be an awesome dad. And I think it's really important to be able to pick your goals and then to be able to pursue those goals uh, with passion and with a lot of effort and energy. I love that. I, I respect when parents really set those boundaries of, I have a kid that I need to go pick up from school and I'm not taking this meeting because it's too right. late for me. Uh, <laughs> I, I respect that so much. Like, it's like, all right, no one's going to die if you don't have this meeting right now. Like, that's true. Yeah. Go get yeah. your kid. And the cool thing is as well is that that mentality, or I guess that approach goes hand in hand with being productive. Like if you're able to get something done faster or better, if you're more effective, whether it's because you know the keyboard shortcuts, or whether it's because you're just more effective with your time and you prioritize things better, uh, that kind of earns you the right to be able to, you know, call some shots in terms of like how you're spending your time. Um, and so there's a very nice complementarity between that approach and like what superhuman is all about at a very fundamental and you know mission driven level is to help people like me and you be more effective in all of our different spheres of life. Yeah. And have time for, for the things that matter more than email. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, taking this in, uh, I, I found something really interesting as I was learning about you and I saw that you're into choir theater piano <laughs> guitar like at first glance it's a little bit different from the methodical type mm. of topics we've been talking about you went to you went to uni for economics yeah um and was part of uh is it pronounced masana the indian Mastana, yeah as well yeah so there's a little bit of a dichotomy there tell us about <laughs> though those two different parts of of you and how they mesh together if at all great question uh i appreciate that well, a couple of thoughts here. So I think that it's important, at least for me personally, to have creative outlets. Uh, it, it, there's only so much number crunching and left brain sort of mathematical thinking I can do in a day, at which point I'm like, my goodness, I just need to listen to some music or I need to do something creative with my, with my brain right now. And so I've always had a desire to like, you know, pursue creative outlets and, and a passion for certain areas. I think the second thing I would mention is uh, growing up, I was very much into the arts and music, uh, you know, theater and uh, that kind of thing over and above sports. <laughs> right. So as a kid, I wasn't very sporty. Uh, I'm a bit more sporty now. I, I, I'm, uh, you know, I enjoy running and skiing and other things. But in terms of the whatever number of hours you have in a day, that's not schoolwork or homework, right? Like I, had a number of hours that I would put towards these these other activities that are more creative, um, like music, and I loved it. What I would say is that there is a tremendous amount of overlap between the things I'm really good at on the sort of quantitative and mathematical side and those areas, whether it's maths or, sorry, whether it's music or, um, you know, even theatre or dance. It's like that. There is a there is a ton of overlap. I mean, it's it's all mathematical at the end of the day, and. For me, like I find the joy in, in seeing that overlap of the Venn diagram of understanding music at a very atomic level and being able to see, you know, whether it's drum patterns or melodies or uh, sound waves or whatever, like being able to kind of understand it at that level was something that I was interested in at a very early age in terms of creating and, and uh, exploring music. So there certainly is there certainly is quite a bit of overlap. Um, <laughs> between some of those pursuits and uh, sort of the, I guess the way I'm hardwired. I love it. Yeah, there's a common theme I'm seeing amongst folks that are very analytical types. And I think I put myself in that bucket as well, where we have these other interests that 
at first glance seem completely unrelated and like mm -hmm. opposite brain, um, but make a lot of sense once you once you dig in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll we'll wrap it up with a couple of closing questions. Um, and I think you might you might have had some time to think about these. <laughs> so that uh, feel free to, to answer as with as long or short of a, a response here. What's one opinion you have about business that you think people would disagree with? Yeah. Um, this is a great question. I think I've already shared a couple of these thoughts in, in this conversation, uh, but but a, a fresh and novel thought that I, I had around this was, I really believe that actions per minute matters. Uh, actions per minute is a metric which uh, most people, I guess, in, in into gaming are familiar with. It is a way of defining how many actions, keyboard shortcuts or keystrokes a gamer, usually a professional gamer, is uh, hitting per minute. And um, I looked this up yesterday, actually, this was really interesting. Professional, yeah, this is a quote from Wikipedia. Professional e-athletes in South Korea usually have average APM scores around 350, but often exceed the 450 mark during intense battle sequences. That is 7.5. Is this like World of Warcraft or Dota? Or what are we, StarCraft? Yeah, it's typically real-time strategy games or um, okay. kind of those those action strategy games. Um, Oh, yeah, hands are flying. <laughs> that is 7.5 keyboard shortcuts per second, right? Sustained over many minutes or, or you know, like a long sequence of uh, of, of kind of, up, you know, playing the game. <laughs> I just find that to be incredible. I just think that's so, that is so cool. It is a phenomenal way of uh, approaching this, you know, this this kind of construct of a, of a game, right? And playing that. Um, and why does that matter? Like what, you know, what, what's, the what's the controversial approach here? Well, I think that in a, in a work setting, but also in in a not work setting, where you asked me about like a business opinion. So in a work setting, if you are pushing your own personal APM, you're getting more done in the same amount of time. And that doesn't mean that it's just about shipping more widgets in the same you know number of minutes as someone else. But you're actually getting more opportunities to learn. You're getting more opportunities to reach the end of a of a problem or or a project and you know, to try something out, have a customer conversation, you know, interview someone, whatever it is. But because you're you're pushing your own actions per minute, like you will have more learning loops and you'll therefore grow faster as a result of your own APM. I think it's controversial because I know lots of folks who are like, that doesn't matter. What matters is working smart, smart, not hard. Or what matters is thinking about the problem and then acting. And like, of course these things matter. Like definitely don't just dive headlong into a problem without thinking about it first. But once you're in the problem... I truly believe that pushing your own APM is uh, it's an important piece of the puzzle. I love it. And we'll, we'll cut this part out, but just a time check. I know we're at yeah. time, but did you have anything to run to? Uh, I appreciate you asking. Uh, I'm good. I can go on. Okay. Yeah, we, we'll, we might take another 10 minutes. Yeah, I'm good. That's fine. All right. Next one then is uh, what's one impactful piece of advice that you've been given? Yeah, I've... I'm, I mentioned this earlier, very fortunate to have been given lots of really impactful uh, advice, but just to pick one, um, again, from, from one of the more senior uh, folks at the consulting company I worked at, Oliver Wyman, um, the advice was to optimize for your own happiness. And again, like I mentioned earlier, this was a daring thing to say in an environment that was very career focused and uh, progression oriented, because career and progression are ways to increase one's happiness, but not the only way to increase one's happiness. So this advice was um, to really sit down and think about, well, what will bring you joy? And for some people, that is career progression. For some people, that is more money, or it is more sort of status or prestige, whatever the you know career KPI is. But for other people, it might be having enough time in the week to exercise, or it might be having the flexibility to travel uh, more month a year or just to be able to like see a family member or a relative who maybe needs your help or you just want to spend time with. There's just so many different definitions of happiness. And I think the advice to figure out what that is and then to optimize for it um, is something I think more people would benefit from hearing. It was certainly very impactful for me to hear that at a relatively early stage in my career. I love that. I wish I got that advice earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> just want to give you a no, hug no and say, worries. hey, I'm glad, I'm glad I know it now. <laughs> you know it now, David. <laughs> um, 
what's uh, maybe in the, in the same vein as that, what's one book you'd recommend more people read? This is going to be completely in the opposite direction. I, I thought about <laughs> okay. this. I was like, what books have I read recently or reread recently? <laughs> Uh, this is going to be so different, but um, a book that I love, and I I think most engineers read, if not like read a summary of, uh, is, is called Clean Code by Robert Cecil Martin. And uh, I actually recommend it to non-engineers. I think this is something that analysts and data scientists, like people who might be writing code, but like maybe not engineers by title, but also anyone who's kind of tech adjacent could benefit from reading. I wish more people did read it, in fact, because in it is what I consider to be the blueprint of, of creating really awesome systems, whether you're writing code or other kinds of systems. And I guess like in growth, which is the area I, I spend a lot of time in, you need not be coding, but like if you're building, for example, uh, pipelines and Zapier scripts and kind of automations and playbooks and such, those are kinds of systems and, and that is sort of code, right? And having the principles from this book, Clean Code, helps you build those systems in a really good way. Uh, that was a book I read earlier in my career. And uh, I think the entire book is full of Java code examples. The only language I was coding in at that time were the languages were SQL and VBA, right? Mm -hmm. But it didn't matter that my language is my coding wasn't the same as that book. It was it was applicable and transferable knowledge nonetheless. So that's that's a book that I'm I'm uh, pretty big on. I I love that. I've heard of the book as a product manager, but it not recommended for non-engineers. So mm -hmm. I'm going to need to, I'm actually looking for a new book right now. So that is perfect. Nice. Awesome. Well, you can probably sk you skip over the, the code examples. I certainly yeah. did. I just never took away the important uh, principles. <laughs> uh, so changing gears a little bit, what's your favorite Nintendo franchise? Oh, goodness me. Uh, you're going to make me pick who's the hardest decision. <laughs> I Let me think. I'm going to have to say Zelda. Uh, Zelda. For Nintendo franchise, yeah. yeah. Legend awesome. of Zelda is, is just so such a well-developed set of games in your universe. Um, uh, maybe a close second would be Donkey Kong. But Donkey Kong is, is, is more, it's more self-contained and like yeah. incredibly enjoyable, but in a, in a small kind of toy box sense, whereas Zelda is this large, expensive universe with all these different facets and bits of lore and music and artwork and everything. So I, I, I think I would say Zelda. Okay. I'm, I'm wondering if your, your answer to this next one is going to be different <laughs> or the same. Uh, what, what's the best video game soundtrack? Right. Yeah. Um, so I will, so I have two, one, I mean, one of them is like 30 years old at this point, almost. Um, and so I have a more recent pick as well. <laughs> the, the one that's really old is for Donkey Kong country two on the Super Nintendo by David Wise. Um, we were talking about this in a Slack channel at Super Human recently. Uh, someone, one of our engineers said, um, they, they went too hard on that soundtrack. <laughs> it is so good. <laughs> it is just so, it slaps so hard. I'm not familiar with that. I'm going to have to listen to it. Okay. It's so good. I don't know if it's going to be as good if you didn't hear it when playing the levels. Um, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of really good YouTube video essays on why it's such a good soundtrack. It, it, it doesn't follow the typical progression of most Nintendo soundtracks of like quirky melodies that kind of like jingle in your ear. It's, it's a lot of like layering of, you know, sound and, and synths. Uh, but there are some incredible melodies like buried in there. Uh, it's, it's just really cool. It's just really well uh, composed. And uh, David Wise, the composer is a, I think a master of, of, of craft. Uh, so that's, that's probably my favorite. I think there's just been so much great so much great music in there and it's influenced a lot of music downstream of of that I, that truly was like mid 90s um a more recent a more recent pick that i i'm, I'm a big fan of right it came up in my spotify wrapped it's like some of the songs i've listened to the most over the last year was um the soundtrack to celeste which is a kind of a platforming action game um released in the last couple of years uh and that's a an incredibly banging soundtrack it's it's composed by Lena Rain, uh, and she's uh, imbued every song or every piece of music. Indeed, the whole game is is, is so fascinating. Uh, psycho like it's the psychology in the game is is really cool and very interesting. And uh, as the composer of this music, like she imbued every song with those emotions, ranging from anxiety and self doubt all the way through to um, jubilation and you know triumph and achievement. Uh, and you you can really hear it in the in the music. Uh, and then if you go into the background of 
of the creators of the music and the game and, and so on. Um, it all just comes together in this really awesome way. As you can tell, I like to go pretty deep on the things I, I enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> so. I, I love it. I, um, you didn't ask, but I'm going to share anyway, because I, I find video game soundtracks fascinating because I learned about the psychology of them and how like they're the best music to focus to. Mm-hmm. But I grew up playing more like RPG. So I was deep into like Square Soft, Square Enix universe, uh, yeah. Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, and all those games. And nice. I can still, I still hum this like many tracks in my head as I'm walking or as I'm working because they're so catchy and thinking about them actually one, it brings me joy. And two, like they're just great songs uh, yeah. to, to just like walk or listen to. So I, yeah. I can appreciate the the depth of interest in, in video game soundtracks. Yeah. Those are, those are some great games. Those are those whole franchises and, and games within that with, with amazing soundtracks. I, I personally didn't play uh, a ton or, you know, didn't have the opportunity as a kid to sort of like own all the consoles and like go in that direction. It's very Nintendo focused, but um, there was a period in my life where I was very much into just video game like music. There's a whole series of online communities that celebrated uh, the music, and I was you know very into those those games through that vector. I love that. All right, so wrapping up here, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, as I think a lot of people in tech are. Those are the two main places, I would say. Uh, but, you know, folks can uh, drop me an email. Uh, it's easy to find my email using tools like Superhuman and Report. <laughs> um, yeah, I I don't maintain yet a uh, sort of website or a particular other presence. But those two places are places that I frequent. Amazing. We'll make sure to link to those in the show notes. Gaurav, it was so great having this conversation with you. I really appreciated the time together. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much. This was a really, really fun conversation. I I also want to give you an extra special uh, shout out and and just kudos for um, such thoughtful and well-researched questions. Uh, You know, you really clearly care a lot about your passion and craft. And that's always something that I admire and respect. And it's very evident from this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. I I appreciate that a lot. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) 